Hey everyone, so a few months ago I got a new job and I haven't uploaded an episode in a while but I'm glad to say that as of today the show returns and this episode was with Cecily Whiteley, a philosopher at the University of Cambridge. So in this episode as usual we spend some time talking about Cecily's life and story so far but unlike every episode spend quite a lot more time discussing her work and ideas. We just kind of did this in two parts. In the first part we talked about Cecily's work on depression. Um, she wrote a very popular uh, paper and post online about her idea that depression should be characterized as an altered state of consciousness. And in the second part of the episode we talk a little bit about aphantasia, which is a relatively unknown mental disorder whereby someone is unable to generate um, forms of visual imagery um, mentally so they kind of almost can't imagine things in a visual way i hope you enjoyed this episode if you do it would really help if you could subscribe to the channel and give this episode a like uh, doing so will ensure that many more people can see this episode so thanks for watching and enjoy the show Cecily, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So first of all, let's think about um, you when you were a little bit younger. So as a child, did you think much about people or about the brain or about the mind? Um, yeah, so I think when I was younger, I wouldn't say I was thinking too much about the mind specifically. I think that um, in general, I think there was a sort of philosophical uh, preoccupation with certain questions, uh, which I think probably came about due to the fact that I had, um, I lost an immediate family member when I was a child. And I think there was something about that which um, opens one up to some sort of type of question if they're not uniquely philosophical, but they're um, philosophical in nature. So questions about, you know, what happens after we die? Is there an afterlife and the God, a God? Um, and, um, you know, questions about how you might want to come about knowing that, right? So is it, should we just take that for granted? Um, or is there evidence for or against that view? Uh, and then there's sort of uh, other philosophical questions, um, which I think I was thinking about, you know, that these sorts of difficult uh, situations bring about. So questions like, you know, given that we're mortal, how should we live our life? Um, and that sort of thing. So it wasn't really a preoccupation with the mind as such, but I think that there was generally a, a sort of interest in, in these sorts of questions, which I now recognise as philosophical questions, um, which at the time I just yeah, thought were important things to think about. So you were thinking about them, did you then kind of practically go out and try and find answers by buying books on, on these topics or something like that when you, when you had these questions? Yeah, um, so I did read a few, um, I suppose, philosophy of religion kind of books um, when I was a teenager. Um, but mostly I think it was speaking to different people <laughs> about this. So I went to a sort of Methodist school. Um, so I remember speaking a lot to um, the chaplain about you know, these sorts of questions, uh, which is, I think is a natural way to go, right? If you're interested in these questions, you think, well, religion has the, has the answers. Were you religious back then? I don't think I would ever say I was very religious, but I was definitely, I had more, I would say I have religious beliefs. Um, which I felt were at the time were, were true. How about now? Do you still have any beliefs? No, I think yeah. that for better or for worse, philosophy has taken those away from me. Sure. Um, yes. You started off going to York, where you did a BA in philosophy, and then went to King's College London. Saw that your, your MPhil, you completed this on the neuroscience of consciousness and its metaphysics. That's the title of your research. Can you say a bit about that and what you got up to there? Yeah, so I would come across consciousness as a research topic in the final year of my undergraduate degree at York. And at this point, I was really uh, set on, on sort of leaving philosophy and transitioning into um, to neuroscience. Um, so it was a postgraduate degree and I had a place on a postgraduate uh, neuroscience course or psychology and neuroscience um, and uh, then I came across consciousness as a as a topic and I thought wow this is just so exciting I must must stay in it and it was primarily through debates on I'm sure you've uh, I know that you've interviewed uh, people that are working in this area so debates about the metaphysical status of consciousness so is consciousness something which current science is 
able to explain or do we need to go undergo something like a paradigm shift in science to accommodate the nature of subjective experience. So what I was doing in my MPhil was sort of motivated by uh, the work that I'd done in my undergraduate on, on the nature of consciousness. And I was interested in the question, which is, I think, an instance of a broader question about the relationship between philosophy and science. Uh, and I was interested in, in the question um, of how it's possible to accept very divergent views about the metaphysical status of consciousness in the world, in the physical world, whilst also accepting everything there is to know about the neural underpinnings of consciousness. So something that struck me as, as, as interesting and, and, and potentially questionable when I was reading all of this philosophical literature on consciousness was that it seemed to be the case that they thought, well, we can be naturalistic about consciousness, so we think that there's a relationship between consciousness and the brain. But people who accepted that ended up with really very divergent views about the place of consciousness in the world. So how is it possible that you could be a naturalistic philosopher of mind and think that consciousness is intimately related to the brain and end up both with the idea that consciousness is an illusion on the one hand and then on the other hand an extreme view that consciousness permeates the universe, right? that electrons are conscious. So what I was doing in that MPhil project was looking at whether or not that sort of assumption about philosophical methodology in consciousness science is justified. Um, and I think it ended up radically changing my views about consciousness um, after having done that research. So yeah, what did your views change to you and what were they prior to that? So I started off um, as what philosophers call non-physicalists about consciousness. So the view that we can't explain with our current scientific methods, uh, subjective experience, right? And that something needs to change, right? Either we need to posit consciousness as a sort of fundamental element of the universe, um, or at least think about how it might have be strongly emergent from the brain in a way which is slightly incompatible with the way that we look at neuroscience at the moment. Um, and so how it changed, I think, was that this assumption which I was looking at, right, so how it's possible to be a naturalist and also accept these quite different metaphysical theses about consciousness, I found out that it just wasn't a very good one. Um, or at least that's what I concluded. So you then did a PhD at LSE. The title of that, if I'm correct, is Kinds and Classification in Constitutional Science. Is this kind of following on quite closely from the stuff we've just discussed or um, um, yeah, what were you up to there exactly? Yeah, so it's slightly different um, actually. So, so, I mean, first thing is I think it was very important, I think, that for me to go to LSE, um, primarily because LSE as a philosophy department has this particular ethos of being, uh, of doing philosophical research, which is in close con contact with science and is continuous with societal problems. And I, I really like the idea of not having to give up the sort of practical element that I thought was important to my life, what I wanted to do in my life, uh, whilst also being able to do philosophy, which I now found I really liked. Mm -hmm. The best of both worlds. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Um, and so the, the project that I have done in my PhD, so it's, it's related to that question, but it sort of looks at it against the background of, of that assumption being true. Um, so the question I was looking at is how can debates in history and philosophy of science over how concepts change over time in science how those sorts of lessons might be applied to consciousness science, so to provide a better explanation of consciousness from neuroscience, so how, how it should be govern consciousness science and structure it to provide this explanation. Um, it's a big question right now in consciousness science. And I was suggesting, and well, this is what I looked at in the PhD, was how we can use lessons from the history and philosophy of science to help answer that question. Um, and what falls out of this is a view of consciousness as being just one more natural phenomenon that we explain. Um, and that's related to the idea that I was looking at my MPhil thesis about the relationship between science and philosophy. I hope I'm not just jumping on the obvious point and trying to guess what it was about, but like Thomas Kuhn's kind of associated idea of the paradigm shift, is, is, is that something you were thinking about um, in terms of consciousness? You mentioned earlier about that maybe we need like a, just a new way of thinking about science and a kind of refresh of it. Was it drawing parallels from that at all? Yeah, I think that, that's relevant to, 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 to the sorts of things that I was trying to do. I wasn't looking at Kuhn specifically, I think. I was more focused on people like Rudolf Carnap 
um, and uh, other philosophers who are interested in how we start from our everyday concepts, which we use to categorise and think about the world, and how those concept, concepts change to become scientific concepts. So uh, what I was one of the central things that I looked at in the thesis was put, putting forward this new concept of consciousness, which I think was better for consciousness science, which is continuous with but diverges from what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness, which is uh, has been the subject of all these uh, heated debates in, in philosophy. Can you elaborate on that? So what was the idea of consciousness you're putting forward slightly different to phenomenal consciousness? So it was what I called a natural kind concept. And natural kinds is a particularly a technical term in philosophy of science. Uh, and it picks out um, a particular type of natural phenomena. So it would be an analysis of consciousness as a concept which is equivalent to something like memory. Um, and the idea was that that concept, it, when you build in various things to that concept, including a particular structure that all natural phenomena in the brain share, and the idea was that you could use that structure to organise a research programme to find the neurological basis of consciousness. As part of this, you went to New York University. Yes, I did. Um, and you, I think David Chalmers was someone you worked with? Yes. At the time. David's, you know, one of the world's most, I guess, famous contemporary philosophers. Uh, what was it like working with him and, and uh, meeting him? Yeah, so so David's great. He's um, It was really nice. Um, I met him at a conference uh, in my MPhil, actually, when I was presenting that sort of, that work on the, the relationship between neuroscience and philosophy of consciousness. And um, yeah, I got in touch with him and he said, you know, come over. And uh, so it was, it was a really great year. I ended up staying longer than I expected. Uh, because I just felt like the philosophical community at NYU was just really uh, amazingly, not only in terms of like philosophically rich, but just as a community. I think especially coming out of COVID, I really enjoyed being a member of that community and I made really good friends. And uh, yeah, it was really useful for my work, I think, to discuss it not only with Dave, but many of the people that are at the Centre for um, the Mind, Brain and Consciousness there. Um, Am I right that like New York University has like often the, maybe the best reputation for a philosophy department in the world? Yes, I think that's relatively... Is that just based on accurate. David and just great, great uh, lectures and researchers there? Why do you think it's got that title? Um, yeah, so it's, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not too sure about the history of it, but I understood that there was a lot of funding to employ top philosophers. So it's not only, in, it's not only uh, David and uh, people like Ned Block, but there's also really uh, famous uh, philosophers who work in ethics and metaphysics um, and I think they've done, done well to cultivate um, their reputation not only in terms of research but their graduate uh, program give, produces uh, philosophers who go on to um, prestigious places to get jobs and uh, in philosophy uh, that's a sign of uh, prestige so it's probably all, all bound together just while we're talking about that kind of interdisciplinary department there, maybe just down here for a second. Um, I mean, you've been talking about consciousness from both a philosophical and a scientific perspective. So like how much of the future of progress and understanding of consciousness do you think will be will be done by philosophers and done mm -hmm. by scientists? Um, if we can kind of divide them up slightly, I know there's overlap, obviously, but how do you see how yeah. much they'll both help? With progression. So I see it as a, as a very much a reciprocal relationship between philosophy and science, so particularly of consciousness, right? I think consciousness is potentially more unique in this, fact, in this way because it was, its history is rooted in philosophy and it's, and it's a very recent history, right? Um, and because it's a, a, an immature research field, arguably, has been at least 10, as early as 10 years ago. There's a lot of work, I think, for a sort of immature research field to get lots of input and help from, from philosophers. Um, but really, when it comes to uh, finding the neural basis, of course, I think that the majority of work will be done in neuroscience. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to go in terms of sorting out the explanandum or the things that we're trying to um, account for in consciousness science. And here's where philosophy, I think, can really help in terms of um, distinguishing between various things which you might associate with consciousness um, and evaluating empirical results in light of various philosophical questions. Um, so you, the idea is that um, neuroscientific data on its own 
um, often doesn't do enough of the work that you need. Right, you need interpretation of that data, um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a, a role for philosophy. To kind of piece things together and say how things relate and yeah, unpack that, things. Sure, so. that, that's what, yeah, that's yeah. certainly one of the one of the crucial things. Great. So, and then you've been at Cambridge for the last few months. Yes. Is there a particular kind of research focus or um, or something about Cambridge that, that, that drew you here? Um, maybe you like your research interests align with what they're up to here. So primarily, it's uh, so what I'm doing now is a um, research fellowship, and it's a time I think to spend three years on a significant piece of research. So. I'm sure we'll get to this, but it's uh, yeah. My folk, it's, it was a, an opportunity to spend three years um, amongst very good researchers working on a body of a particular body of research. Um, okay, and yeah, that leads nicely on then to the first of two papers I wanted to, uh, to speak to you about. So you released this paper, I believe, last year, maybe a couple of years ago, 2021. August 2021 is when it got accepted. Okay. Um, but it's yet to be officially published. But uh, uh, okay, um, okay. Yes. yes. Um, so the paper is titled "Depression as a Disorder of Consciousness." Um, like you mentioned earlier, and I was, you know, starting to read in the acknowledgments relating to the paper. Um, you know, it's partly inspired by um, you sadly losing your your brother. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, is, is this an area that you think you maybe wouldn't have got into at all if this hadn't if this hadn't um, if this hadn't occurred, or do you think you may have been like how much was it was it just directly related to your brother? Was it just the total inspiration of the paper? Was, was mental health and stuff, you think, something that you may be interested in already? Yeah, um, so of course, yeah, I think it was, it was an important factor, I think, which did drive my work and interest in depression, um, and still does. Uh, I suppose it's natural to think that um, when one's been affected by this sort of thing, that one naturally becomes more interested in, in what it is, right? Um, and I think in the case of depression, that's potentially more so, given that there's sort of lack of, of understanding of, of the nature of depression. Um, but in terms of my, my own sort of approach and how I came to even think about um, the issue which I look at in the paper. So in my MPhil, in addition to that research project on the nature of consciousness and metaphysics of consciousness, I was also um, interested in the nature of dreams. Um, that was through uh, another philosopher who I was working with there, uh, Matthew Soterio, who's working on uh, the nature of dreaming. And um, so, yeah, so I was, I was interested in these questions, really, and thinking about how, what happens when we fall asleep and dream, and what happens when we wake up, right? What is the nature of these changes? Um, and at the same time, so, so obviously been interested in depression for the reasons I just said, uh, but I'd also been depressed myself, so, and this was sort of something that started in my undergraduate degree um, and sort of periodically was affecting me. Um, and... It was just through reading papers about the nature of these transitions in consciousness, so the phenomenology of waking up, um, that just sparked a connection in my head about, well, actually, that's actually quite similar to what it feels like to wake up from depression Mm. or emerge from a depressive episode. Mm. Um, And then I thought, oh, well, that's something that, no wonder, wonder how... uh, uh, how that stands up to all the all the literature on depression um, that's out there. Yeah, yeah. So, and before coming on to getting you to kind of lay out your your approach of you know how you think perhaps is the best way to understand depression, I want to ask two things. First of all, I mean, how do you think like a kind of typical person um, who maybe hasn't thought too deeply about it at all would 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 think and kind of explain what depression is? What would you think they'd they'd say? Yeah. So I, I mean. I don't want to speak for, for everyone, right? Sure. <laughs> what does everyone think of mm-hmm. depression is? I'm, I'm sure that there's many different conceptions of depression, right? But, but nonetheless, I think that um, it's true that there's at least one conception of depression out there, which um, you can see in various sorts of writings about depression, um, and even just speaking to people about depression, where there's a sort of strong connection between being depressed and being sad, um, or slightly more... Uh, and this is leading slightly more towards the um, clinical understanding of depression in terms of a low mood, right? So, um, and in particular, there's this potential association between being depressed and having an ability to stop being depressed if you're depressed. So you hear this sort of old-fashioned way of thinking about depression of, oh, you just shake yourself out of it. 
Um, and even if that's not around as much anymore, there's still this idea, well, you just go to the gym or do various things, then you'll be, you'll, you'll, you'll be happier again, right? Um, so whether or not that's everyone's conception of depression, I think that there's at least um, a good case to be made that there is a, a conception of depression out there like that. Um, and of course, I think part of the problem when it comes to depression is that there is just a lack of positive conception of what on earth is going on when you're depressed, right? And I think that's, um, so it's sort of combined with this particular view of depression in terms of just feeling more um, down than usual uh, in a way that's continuous with our experience, our everyday experience, um, as well as just for many people, just a lack of understanding of what depression really is. So in a clinical context, perhaps um, like specifically in the, the DSM, maybe you want to explain what the DSM is as well. Is this, is this similar to how it's understood there? Yeah, I think that there's a, it's, it's continuous with it, I think. Um, although potentially this idea of sadness doesn't play that same role in the clinical context. So in the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is used to classify mental illnesses and diagnose them for uh, clinical psychiatrists and doctors, um, you have a conception of, of depression uh, in terms of, so if, if I was going to diagnose you with depression, um, I'd be wanting, and I was a doctor, I'd be wanting to look at whether or not there was evidence for at least a discrete depressive episode that lasts at least two weeks. Yes, how, how does that get diagnosed? So um, clinically, and obviously this changes given various um, specifiers of depression, but one way of, of diagnosing major depressive disorder is that you must the, the patient must have a low mood, um, a persistent low mood, and a loss of interest uh, in general activities. And then there are certain sort of further conditions that one should meet but not need to meet all of them. Um, and these are things like a loss of appetite or a gain in appetite, sleep disturbances, so insomnia or sleeping too much. And then there are the sort of um, other, so maybe potentially more phenomenological uh, criteria, as feelings of worthlessness and suicidal ideation. So this is the sort of clinical way of uh, capturing or conceptualizing depression, um, which um, I think maybe worth noting is that um, unlike other bodily somatic disorders, you diagnose depression based on subjective reports. So there's not a sort of objective test that you can do. You can't take a blood test to find out if you're depressed, right? So what's being relied on here is people's reports about what patients are saying about their experiences. In a sense, could you do some kind of test though? Could you, um, could you get people to report their experiences? Kind of, I don't know, try and explain them, write them down, speak them out as, in as much detail as possible and then just see how they kind of compare to what you've... Uh, to what you kind of conceptualise as depression as being, um, and then in a sense, it's not as precise a test, I suppose, as a blood test, but you're at least kind of seeing how close it seems to fit to the description? Yes, exactly. Is that like a fair way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly what um, a number of philosophers uh, who've worked um, on depression have done. Um, and in fact, it's those exact reports that you're saying that I've used initially in my paper as evidence against that conception that we find in clinical psychiatry um, and motivate a sort of an alternative understanding of that, depression. In that case then, yeah, I suppose it's time then to ask, so what exactly is your alternative conception of depression? How do you think it's maybe a better way to, t to understand it than, than, uh, than in the DSM and in the kind of typical clinical context? Yeah, so I think very simply, the idea is that what happens when a person is depressed is that their global state of consciousness change changes. And so this is a, a concept that you find it both in philosophy and neuroscience of consciousness. It's a sort of core aspect of consciousness which neuroscientists and philosophers are trying to um, investigate and find the neural basis of. Um, and this concept of a global state of consciousness picks out things like an ordinary state of wakefulness, which we're both in now, uh, states like dreaming, and um, potentially more uh, extreme cases like psychedelic experiences and meditative states. So I think just to unpack uh, the, the idea a bit more, because I think it's important to motivate um, the distinction. Um, so if I ask you to reflect on 
uh, two different sorts of changes to your conscious experience which occur on a regular basis, so that occur every day in a non-pathological sense. So uh, the first would be changes to what you're experiencing. So if you left the room right now and went outside, you'd have a change in perceptual experience, right? You'd, you'd, you won't be seeing this room anymore, you'd be seeing uh, the River Cam and, and Magdalen College, um, and you've had a change in your experience there, right? Um, and things arguably like uh, emotions are like this, right? So they, they, they involve changes to your experience uh, on a particular level of your conscious experience, right? So we can contrast those cases, uh, and this is what philosophers and neuroscientists have called changes to conscious content with this alternative type of change, which occurs regularly, uh, which is the change, which we've gestured out already, um, of the kind when you fall asleep and start dreaming this evening, or tomorrow morning when you wake up from a dream or dream of sleep into this wakeful consciousness, right? So philosophical and just everyday reflection on these two cases suggests that these are not the same sorts of changes, right? So in the latter case, right, which you might call a change to a global state of consciousness, your experience is changing in a very dramatic, profound and global way, hence the, the name global, right? So if you think about when you're dreaming, you'll often have uh, robust changes to your experience. For example, um, your sense of an experience of time will be drastically different often than when you're awake in the day. Your sense of self will change quite dramatically. And of course, in the psychedelic case, this is seen in the ego dissolution that's reported. But in dreams, you see sort of more subtle changes to the self, right? So you might dream that you're uh, a different person to who you are. You might dream that you don't have a body. You might be disembodied. You might just be looking down at a scene. Um, and so the idea here is that this type of change, reflection on these cases suggests that there's a type of change to your conscious experience, which is a different sort of the one if I was just walk out the door and change my environmental um, setting and my perceptual experience will change. And so the idea about depression that I'm wanting to put forward is that depression, when we look at what people say about their experiences of depression, suggests that depression may be best explained in terms of changes to this latter sort, right? And that many of the problems that arise in psychiatry in studying depression might arise because of a mistaken idea that depression actually can be analysed at the former level, right? in terms of low moods that come and go, um, ex emotional experiences and thoughts, right? It might be that there's a much more profound difference which occurs in depression, which suggests a very different conception of, of depression. Um, and, and as I say in the paper, I think that um, the main motivation at the beginning to think why this might be true is that just this is what suggest, is suggested by looking at many different reports of what people who are depressed say about their experiences. So the idea is not just that, oh, I've, I've had depression and maybe this fits my own experience, right? The idea is that I've looked at a large number of reports of what people say depression is like, and they often say things like, there's a fundamental shift to my experience, right? It's like waking up to a nightmare all the time. Um, there's something which is profoundly different to my experience than when I'm not depressed, right? Um, and they also mention these changes to time and self, which are indicative of changes to a global state of consciousness. So how is it that you differentiate between different contents of consciousness and states? Could one not say, for example, that changes in sense of self and time are are just uh, a different a change, a, a differences in content, like a difference in uh, what you see, like perceptual changes. Why are these ones thought as more like fundamental and profound changes? Um, are they not just on a, are they not just to a higher degree, like changes in content? Why are these kind of so different than all the little changes in content of consciousness that I suppose I'm having in the next like five minutes or so? Why, why is there that difference? Okay. Yeah, so I think that's um, an excellent question, right? And one that, uh something that I've been thinking about, right? So why can't, why do we really view these things as separate categories or different sorts of change? Um, and I think there are, there are sort of various things to say. So, so the first thing about why, you know, why can't we just reduce a particular global state of consciousness like dreaming to particular contents? Um, so, so one problem with that uh, approach 
is that it seems very difficult to think about what all dreams have in common in terms of content. So if you, for any dream, you can imagine very, the content of one's dream can be very similar to what one has when one's awake, or maybe when one's hallucinating. And so you sort of run into problems um, initially through that sort of view. Um, another thing which I think is potentially more important is that there seems to be more to what it is to be in a different global state of consciousness than just content. So when you think about what it is, it, what is it to dream um, or what happens when you become drunk, for example, if you think that being drunk is a different global state of consciousness or, or high on psychedelics, right? What, what is involved in that, right? So of course it's partly to do with the content, right? Changes to your self, sense of self, if you think that's content, uh, if that can be classified as content. Um, but it's going to be involved, an analysis of, of what it is to, for example, to dream is going to involve more than that, right? Um, and what, what more is that, right? Um, there seems to be something about changing state of consciousness in a global sense, which involves a change in an individual's capacities to do things. So there are things that I can't do when I'm dreaming that I can do when I'm awake, right? And same for being high and being drunk, right? That seems to be actually quite central to what it is to be in those states. Um, so there's a various relationship between, a, particular, a relationship between being in a global state of consciousness and being capacitated in various ways, right? So potentially when I'm in a non-lucid dream, for example, like I don't have the capacity to reason in the same way that I do. Um, and when I'm, uh, there's similar sort of things apply, of course, in, in the psychedelic case. I mean, you said earlier that you yourself have suffered from depression. Mm. I was going to ask the question why you think, you know, this, your conceptualization of depression has perhaps been overlooked so far, because it sounds very sensible. Do you think that one thing could be lots of philosophers, well, maybe not so much philosophers, people in the clinical context, people coming up with these ideas have maybe not had the experience themselves, um, and that's made it harder to, or, um, to, to think about, or they've just... I mean, I suppose it's a combination. They've maybe just not thought through the way you've done that as well. But yeah, how much do you think someone trying to diagnose depression who hasn't had it themselves is um, is not helpful? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, so I mean, not, when I've thought about that question before, you know, because exactly what you're saying is, is sort of the feedback that I've, I've got from many people, members of the public, uh, psychiatrists who've sort of got in touch and said, you know, wow, this seems so intuitive and it really does make sense of my experience, right? It seems very like intuitive to me that, that this is true um why have people not thought of this before right um and personally it's not in, in my view it, i never seemed to, to lean towards the idea it's because people have never experienced depression uh, but rather i think it's because they just lack the right sort of conceptual toolkit that they that they that we now have or we've only just beginning to have to think about consciousness so um, i think a big part of the reason is that consciousness has been pushed out of scientific investigation for a, for a long, long time, um, at least in sort of post-behaviorist psychology, right? That's the sort of common story of why, really it was only in the 1990s that consciousness began to be a, seen as a legitimate, respectable scientific uh, research program. Um, so I think it's only really because um, there's just not been enough scientific focus on consciousness and changes in consciousness. Um, and changes of the, the, the sort of dreaming wakefulness case um, is, um, is I guess, I think important in this, in this regard of why, explaining why um, it's not been, um, been thought about. I mean, that being said, you do get, if you look back in the history of, of psychology and psychiatry, you do seem to have various suggestions um, which are in line with what I'm saying. So you, you find various descriptions, of, for example, of schizophrenia um, in terms of a waking dream. Um, so so it's not, I'm not the, definitely not the first person to have made a, a connection, but I think that, and I should say, I think it's not essentially a philosophical connection. Um, I think I just happened to be uh, lucky that I was you know, I had depression and I was working on dreaming and at the intersection of neuroscience and philosophy. Um, so I think it was, it's definitely not one which is, is, is that needed to be motivated philosophically at all. Um, it's someone that 
works in neuroscience and psychology of consciousness could have easily made the same connection. Um, I think towards the latter part of the paper, you, you talk about how your hypothesis is potentially testable mm-hmm. using some kind of brain imaging techniques. Can't quite remember. Could you lay that out and explain how you think it may be um, subject to testing? Yeah, so I think that's, that's really important and something that I'm thinking about um, right now um, and wanting to um, work on for the next three, three years at least. Um, so I'm thinking at the moment and collaborating with various people to try and devise different tests and predictions that my model makes, which is not made by other accounts or models of depression, um, and devising ways of, of testing them. So um, I think uh, one that I have sort of ongoing collaboration with that's sort of in the pipeline is um, one which is sort of an early test, which looks at um, the metrics and uh, ways of examining psychedelic experiences. So um, there's a team at Johns Hopkins University uh, working on uh, psychedelic experience, and they have standard questionnaires uh, of, uh, which are used to probe the psychedelic experience. So it's a prediction of my model that even though the scores for people with depression, they wouldn't be the same as the psychedelic case, but they're going to be statistically different from uh, wake, waking, healthy, normal people. Um, so that's a, I think that, that's a sort of early test which we can look at to give us, you know, is there um, more of this phenomenological or subjective evidence which we can use to shed light on uh, the viability of this global state model. Uh, a potentially more um, robust or objective way of testing the model is to look at poten- potential um, markers or uh, features which correlate in the brain when one is uh, in a different state of consciousness um, versus wakeful consciousness. So I looked at one of these in the paper um, and very uh, roughly it's this idea that there's a measure for brain complexity which correlates with different states of consciousness. So again, my model would predict that there's going to be a sort of change in brain complexity. Um, in patients with depression. So there is, a, there is an early study that's already been done on this, which, which showed that that's true. Um, but um, someone that uh, has reached out to me, a uh, neuroscientist and psychiatrist at Birmingham, is uh, interested in, in looking at this um, as a, a way of testing the model. So if you do the testing and it confirms what you're thinking, what would be the possible practical implications of this for treatment of depression? And uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think, so I think they're hu- it's, it's potentially huge. Um, and open-ended. Um, so I think there's there's two sorts of two strands I think of, of things that we can we can say. So you're asking about treatment, right? So I mean, there's also issues about how it might improve diagnosis, but that's a separate issue. So sort of firstly, so so um, in the case of depression, if you want if you have depression and you want to, uh, and you're looking for treatment, you have generally two options. So you have which I'm sure. Um, you're uh, aware of, so you can either take, you can either have sort of pharmacological interventions, so you can take antidepressants, um, and you can have therapy, right? So, um, and I think that one of the thing, big things which is uh, driving lots of research into depression, huge amounts of money going into it, is the fact that these aren't very effective. So combined, they have about 50% um, uh, efficacy, um, and potentially worse if you um, look at some studies over others. Um, so this is driving the need for more effective treatment options for depression. Uh, so you might ask, well, it, why is that? Why is it so ineffective? Given it's such a huge, it's so prevalent depression, right? Um, and other mental illnesses. So um, the standard answer to that question is that unlike something like a bodily or somatic disorder like diabetes, there's As of yet, there's no agreed upon biological explanation for depression. So uh, if you have a biological explanation for a disorder or disease, you can then intervene on it effectively, right? In the cases of depression, while there's been a huge amount of very good research on biomarkers which correlate with the onset of depression, there's not an agreed upon account of what's, what's explaining all those different changes which correlate with depression, right? There's no sort of biological explanation or mechanism which you can look at in the brain and then intervene on it, right? So if you're asking how does my model affect treatment, 
the, the most obvious way it would do this is it would, it would point us in a new direction or point clinical and uh, neuroscience of depression to look at potentially different aspects of the brain, right? Namely, not those which are responsible for low mood, but those which are involved in maintaining and um, changing global states of consciousness. Um, and in consciousness science, there's not necessarily agreed account on that either, but the idea would be it along the line when this research progresses and it's going full speed at the moment, you'd have, an, if, if this hypothesis is right, you'd have a much more accurate way of intervening on depression um, through looking at the neural basis of changes of global states of consciousness, right? So, so that's, I think, the, the most obvious thing, right? So it gives you, if not immediate answers, right? It gives you a research program, which may lead to incredibly much more effective treatment options. Um, and then there's a sort of second strand to thinking about how my model might change treatment. And that's to do with psychedelic psychiatry. So psychedelic psychiatry is this very big movement at the moment, which looks to we take that problem that I started with, the, the fact that there's not many effective treatment options. One response to this, which has been starting to be explored in, in a lot of depth, is the, the idea that we can treat mental disorders, including depression, with psychedelics like psilocybin. Um, and this is getting a lot of attention at the moment. Um, but early clinical trials looked promising, right? So it looks like just one dose or one set of treatments of psychedelic therapy um, is much more effective than our standard treatment options. Um, and there's a huge question here, which is why does that work? Um, Obviously, the, the fact that it has good outcomes is, is, is good enough reason to keep going, right? But it's still a very important question for science and for psychiatry, is that why, why is it working, right? And there's various proposals out there um, in the literature. Um, and I think one of the things I looked at in the paper in which I'm developing further at the moment is this idea that a particular view of depression might, that I have might actually explain this right so it's not just so typical uh accounts of why psychedelic psychiatry might work or proposals i won't really say that they're not the worked out accounts for their hypotheses um pay more attention to the nature of psychedelic experiences themselves so it's like what do psychedelic experiences um do how do they alter the brain might they change one's um sense of self or uh alterations and that might be key to the insights which are generated by psychedelic therapy. So what my uh, what this global state model makes possible is this idea that it might be something and this might not be um, in tension with those hypotheses but it might be in a sort of additional and potentially um, uh, broader explanation which relates to what these hypotheses are about the self is that it's something in depression itself which explains why psychedelics might work in treating depression. So the very general idea is that what psychedelics do on my model of depression is that it propels one out of this entrenched pathological state of conscious, global state of consciousness. It propels one out of that state into it in a different state of consciousness, right? And then the idea is that when one comes out of that psychedelic state, one emerges not back to the depressive state of consciousness that one was in, but emerges rather to sort of standard healthy kind of wakeful consciousness, which uh, hopefully we're both in at the moment. Just while we're kind of there talking about psychedelics, I think, you know, I just wonder if you were to kind of look maybe five, 10, 10, 20 years in the future, do you, do you think, how prevalent do you think their usage could possibly be? Um, I mean, may, maybe it could be like, like as you say, you, you're uh, the, the ideas you're putting forward here could kind of inform and, and help kind of argue that this should be the case. But yeah, have you got any thoughts on where you think we could be with this stuff in, in 5, 10, 20 years? Yeah, well, I think it's definitely very plausible that, it, that psychedelics may become a standard treatment option. So I think it was yesterday that it became um, approved for use in Australia, in Australia for, for treating uh, mental disorders. Um, so yeah, I can totally imagine that and would hope that uh, if not psychedelics, that in 20 years, then there will be uh, a huge uh, further range of treatment options for depression. I mean, it's just getting so much funding at the moment to work on, on, on uh, treatments for depression.
um, that you know we can hopefully be optimistic and think that um, this is going to improve. I think a large majority of the population are very skeptical. Um, it's okay to say so. Probably like older people, a bit more skeptical of, of, of psychedelic therapy. If someone is completely skeptical and came to you and said that this sounds like a mad idea, what, how would you kind of lay it out to them? Explain to them why you think, uh, yeah, it's it's actually more sensible than it seems. A lot of people think it's quite a crazy idea. I think still. Yeah, interesting. Um, and I think that's potentially just part of a stigma that's surrounded the history of psychedelics. Um, but I mean, well, the first thing to say is just that it seems to work. So um, given the prevalence and importance of the issue, that alone should give you good reason to take them seriously, whether or not you think that it's a silly idea. <laughs> if it's a silly idea that generates um, good results, then that should be, <laughs> that should be enough. Um, but I, I suppose if I was trying to motivate it more broadly, then I would appeal to these ideas about radical changes to consciousness which psychedelics enable right um and using motivating um treating depression in virtue of these sort of room for various sorts of insights that psychedelics make possible um, which are just not available to people who are in a um who are, who are not who are not in a psychedelic setting i think i've spoke to certain people and it's unfortunately i guess this like umbrella term uh you know the word drugs that psychedelics fall under and so that puts a lot of people off but i suppose you can you got to make sure that people understand at the same time it's not like this is a free-for-all we're proposing that heroin and crack cocaine and all of these substances are beneficial i'm sure there's many of these we'd say these under no circumstance will ever help we're just saying there's been this maybe one particular um, kind of drug psychedelics that actually seems to be misunderstood but at the same time we're not saying that uh, you know, there's benefits in, in every kind of drug I think when people I actually had conversations with people who then seem to would kind of say to me I guess then you're up for saying that heroin would be possible treatment of someone else but that's just this kind of grouping is just a bit too simplistic isn't yeah, it? we no, need to kind no, of get that, away from that word and I don't, I don't think it's a, it. a stretch to say that I think that's completely ridiculous I suppose yeah. um, I think maybe that one of the big things here is that the the safety of psychedelic drugs compared to other drugs right so and there's been a huge amount of work on this in order to be able to even use them in clinical trials right so there's no adverse effects from having the sorts of uh psychedelic therapy that people are talking about here so it's not like just making them widely available um but it's using them under particular control conditions which have research has shown that there's no adverse effects on on someone from, from using these psychedelics in that context. Okay, so kind of moving back to the paper more generally, one question I had was, do you think other mental disorders, so for example, like general anxi- generalized anxiety disorder, schizophrenia, do you see these as also being possible um, in a similar camp to depression or are these more just differences in the contents of consciousness, like how, are there many other disorders you can see as maybe fall under your, your conception as well of, a, of being kind of radically different and not just slightly different? I'm definitely open to that, um, to that possibility. Um, again, I think I've only had time at the moment to look at depression. Um, but something that m- many people have, have sort of asked me and got in touch to ask me about is schizophrenia, because it seems like this seems like a very good candidate for the sort of analysis that I'm giving. Um, and, and yeah, I think there's room also there. I think, again, someone else has approached me about testing this idea about in terms of schizophrenia. So again, I'm very open to that, even though I don't think I've done enough research yet to make a confident assertion one way or the other. Um, in terms of anxiety, I'm, I'm less sure, um, but only from sort of my own phenomenological observations of what it's like to be anxious versus what it's like to be depressed. Uh, but then, of course, it's possible that there is potential things which are grouped under anxiety which would count in that regard right? um, I was just having a conversation the other the other week where someone actually said to me that that they like this analysis for their own experiences of anxiety um, and again I think like the depression case it's just an open empirical question whether or not um, this is right right whether that analysis might work I just wanted to also ask about um, a point you made earlier about some people would maybe suggest one way you could alleviate some, at least some of your depression would be to you know go to the gym or exercise or something. Yeah. It made me think, is it, what about some kind of hybrid conception of depression where it's this kind of um, radical global shift, but there are also specific just 
changes in the contents of consciousness, which maybe, for example, going to the gym could, you know, in a small way, target some of these kind of more minor changes and help with depression in that sense, but not in any way be able to kind of wake you up from the, the kind of very different yeah. place that you're in. Is it is it a mixture of the two or is it just kind of one way of looking at that? Uh, no, um, I, I think that's right. So I suppose nothing that I'm trying to say is to rule out that there's a neural biological basis for depression. Um, such that there are many things that you can do to help either maintain a normal state of wakeful consciousness or um, stop being depressed, right? So in the case of exercise, for example, so um, I think that's a, a very good point and m- many people have pointed out and it's in the research, right, that the, the exercise can really help. Um, I think what what needs to be said here and something that I, I, I've been thinking of is... is there's a, and this is um, seems plausible to me, right? That um, there's a sense in which you're when you're depressed or becoming depressed, that doing things like exercise and stuff can very much help. And then there's this well, intuitive idea that once you go past a certain point, there's nothing that helps. And this is a place that I think you know I I've, I've been in before, right? And there's a distinct kind of train <laughs> that you, and it's sort of a process that you're becoming depressed right you can feel yourself becoming depressed um and so you know there are various things you can do um so so what i would want to say in, in this case is, is absolutely yes um but i think the things that i'm targeting and i think uh things that need more radical intervention like psychedelic cases is these very much uh really severe treatment resistant depression um and I think it's likely that, you know, where we thought there might just be one thing, it's not just one kind of global state, it might be really the best way to think about it. And I think I did start looking at this in the paper, is looking at it as a sort of process of change, which which can occur quite gradually in some cases, uh, but it needn't do, right? Uh, and I think that fits the phenomenology of, of, of many people's experiences of depression. It's not like you wake up and all of a sudden, I mean, you can do, but it's not, not everyone's experience is, is such that, you just wake up and, and you're in this completely di- different place, even though um, that can happen. A lot of the time it's like a sort of slow process. Um, so I think a good analogy here is becoming drunk So um, and becoming sober. You sober up over time and there's sort of discrete stages to your experience. And you will end up, when you're getting drunk, you'll end up in a very, very <laughs> different place than when you started. Um, and But there's a process here, so, you know. Just to take crude examples, you know, if you drink water um, after a few drinks, maybe that, that'll help you sober up. But once you get to a certain place, drinking water or taking a shower or whatever, it's not going to do anything because you're so you're so far gone, if that makes sense. Um, and even that sort of crude analogy, it, it's, it's a way of thinking of, I think, of depression um, and uh, that, I, that I'm uh, uh, sympathetic to. Yeah, so the the paper, I guess, got kind of turned into an article that was posted on the website Psyche. Um, It was very popular. I saw it it kind of shared across the web, across Twitter especially, quite a lot. Just wondering why you think this kind of um, was a popular article that lots of people are interested in. Yeah, no, it was really, really good to to have such a positive response. I had a really nice part of of my job, and one that you don't necessarily uh, anticipate as a philosopher is having... uh, yeah, this sort of effect on on, on people in, in general, right? So, you know, the view of philosophy is sort of a detached academic exercise. It was very nice. Um, but as to why um, it proved popular, so I think one of the things which I touched on in, in the article and that has been stressed to me in a number of emails that people have sent afterwards is this idea of uh, of not just a purely empirical implication for this model of depression, but uh, a sort of slightly different one um, insofar as it enables people who are depressed or who have loved ones who are depressed um, to understand each other's experiences and explain uh, one's experience to um, to other people. So I suppose one of the things which comes up a lot in, in these subjective reports of what it's like to be depressed is this idea that um, depression is 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 it's bad not only because it, the sort of experience you're having is bad but there's this sort of old, uh, extra bit which is that you just don't know what's happening to yourself right so you know if you get cancer for example it's really awful and traumatic 
but you know exactly what's going on, right? In the case of depression, you're having these really bad experiences, changes to your experience. You feel awful, um, but you just don't know in the same sense as you know in other cases what's happening to you. Uh, and for this reason, it makes it very difficult to explain to someone um, what's happening because you don't really know yourself, right? You know that something bad is happening, uh, but you don't know exactly what. Um, and the same, I've heard this a lot from people who have uh, you know, uh, friends and family, close friends and family, sons and daughters who are depressed. So you know that so you can see that there's a change happening, but you just don't really know what's, what's going on. Um, and the idea is that this understanding of depression is this global shift in consciousness helps people explain to other people um, as well and also themselves what's going on so um, so even if people have never been depressed before they will be familiar with um, various sorts of changes to their experience so they probably you know they, they dream um, they've been drunk maybe they do meditation um, and in this way you can sort of see even though it's not quite the same as those things there's um, a level of explanation which you can sort of appeal to here um, and I think people uh, and this is something that came up a lot in emails, is that people found that very, um, very useful, um, which was nice. An interesting description on the, on the article of um, some people who've had depression, that they've kind of described it as they enter a different world, um, perhaps it's like a nightmare. Um, yeah, these seem interesting ways to describe it. Um, they kind of, I guess, yeah, fit with fit with your your idea as well. This entering a different world seems like a yeah, like a good good explanation. Exactly. So yeah. I think it, you know, in my view, it's not literal. They're not literally in a in a different world, but it's a, a sort of uh, metaphorical description in the same way as when you're dreaming, you're in a dream world, right? You're in a different world. <laughs> um, you're not literally in a different world, but there's a, a different world of your experience, which is not the same as the one that you have when you're awake. Um, and healthy. Okay, very interesting. So let's move on now to the, the second paper I wanted to, to ask you about. So titled Aphantasia, Imagination and Dreaming. Let's start off first of all with just a definition. So what, what is to you aphan, aphantasia? So this is a another controversial uh, issue, but um, and there is a big debate at the moment about you know, how exactly should we understand it? How do we define it? Um, but very um, roughly, and this is how it's been operationalized, recently is just an ability to visually imagine at will. So uh, many people uh, are familiar with an experience of mental imagery. So if I close my eyes right now and imagine seeing my childhood house, right? Uh, there's a, usually people think that that involves this mental imagery. Um, but there's this small percentage of the population who report not having those experiences. So they don't see an image of a house, right? Or an image of a loved one's face. They have sort of more of a thought-like uh, experience. So just thinking of, um, imagining that one is seeing one's bedroom, right? Do you know at all what percentage of the population uh, have such a condition? Well, I think this changes all the time because given that the research is sort of ongoing, and covering more and more people. Uh, and when I wrote the paper, it was around uh, three or five percent, um, but I'm not sure about the up to date. Three to five, yeah, that's interesting. I think that's more than I would have guessed, and I think a lot of people maybe aren't even aware this is a condition at all. No, exactly, yeah. So, this is a, it is a um, really sort of recent rediscovery, and I say rediscovery because there was documentation of, of this disorder um, way before um, it's now become a, a phenomenon, but. Um, yeah, I think it's it's been so. Uh, Adam Zeman at the University of Exeter is the is the uh, neuroscientist doing a lot of the the core work on this. Um, and yeah, I think it's through the um, sort of um, publication of of and sort of media of of this work um, that is becoming more of a well known phenomenon. Um, yeah. so there's various Facebook groups and there's a website for aphantasia like the network uh, now so you know, if you're think you're experiencing aphantasia there's this whole website you can go to with lots of information about it so what's the main um argument you're putting forward in the paper could you kind of give us an outline of the paper and what um what you're proposing in it so i think there's a relevant background to the paper which i might have to say something about first before i get into the specific argument so really what i'm doing in that paper is intervening on a particular literature in philosophy and psychology about the nature of dreams. So the question is, when I'm dreaming, 
that I'm standing in front of the Tower of London? What kind of experience am I having? Um, and this question primarily is driven by, uh, in philosophy at least, by a different sort of debate which was started, not started off by Descartes, but made famous by Descartes, um, about the extent to which dreams, the possibility that we could be dreaming threatens our everyday knowledge of the world. So there's a particular view of dreams on this that's driving this idea, is that when one is having a dream, right, that one is standing in front of the Tower of London, one's having a perceptual or hallucinatory kind of experience. So that experience that I'm having when I'm dreaming is going to be the same kind as if I were to sort of visually perceive um, the Tower of London. Right? Um, and this threatens our knowledge of everyday uh, objects in the world in virtue of the fact that it, it could be possible that we're just dreaming right now. Right. Um, so all my beliefs about the world, the, the, the table in front of me and the chair, uh, might all just be false. Right. Um, so there's a response to, to this sort of model or line of thinking um, in the last 20, 30 years, which tries to block those sort of philosophical, sceptical arguments. Um, and the model is uh, arguing and putting forward this idea that um, instead of hallucinatory or perceptual experiences, the experiences that one has when one dreams are just not of this kind at all. What they are is imaginative experiences. So when I'm dreaming on this view of the, of, of the Tower of London, um, my experience is going to be imaginative. So it's going to be the same as if I was sort of close my eyes, imagine the Tower of London. Um, and the reason how this gets you um, away from scepticism is that it uh, seems possible that you can have all these imaginative experiences without actually believing anything, right? So it might just be that you're just imagining that you're um, seeing the, the Tower of London, right? But you're not actually having a belief which is false um, because, of, because of the fact that it's not perceptual, it's, it's imaginative. Um, so that's a sort of background <laughs> of, the, of, of the debate, right? So, so what I'm doing in that paper is challenging um, the viability and the empirical viability of that imaginative model based on aphantasia. So, so how would you um, put forward your position here and argue for it? Um, yeah, what do you kind of propose in the paper and what are your arguments for it? Yeah, so what I'm doing is I'm using um, these recent studies of, of aphantasia to try and challenge this alternative imagination model of dreaming. So on the most recent formulations of this imagination model of dreaming, it predicts that people who lack waking imagery so you lack mental imagery when they're awake. Um, also, will, would not have visual dreams. So what the idea in the paper is a, is a pretty simple one, is that when you look at the, um, the recent studies and um, interviews and um, work on aphantasia, um, so these growing number of people that are saying that they lack visual mental imagery, um, they still report having rich visual dreams. Um, so the argument is that this is a prediction made by this model, which is just not borne out by the recent work, um, and that we should therefore either reject the imagination model or revise it um, to accommodate this data. So it's sort of the idea is that there's a sort of central and new um, thing to be explained by theories of dreaming in the aphantasia case, uh, which wasn't available before. And you offer like a revision to this um, towards the end of the paper. How exactly would you explain that? Yeah, so, so what is one possibility, I think, that, that um, so I looked at how, so if one wanted to keep this imagination model of dreaming, how might one do so? Uh, and so what I suggested, and this was drawing on literature which is already out there by Matthew Soterio and Thomas Crowther, is to think about um, the imaginative experiences that one has when one's dreaming, not in terms of agential experiences. So a standard way of distinguishing between what, what is imagination versus what is perception is to think of imagination as being agential or subject to the will, is what philosophers call it, right? And this was the, 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 the driving account of the imagination model, right? So the, the idea is that when one's dreaming, even though maybe one's not fully um, exercising agency over one's experience, like for example in a lucid dream, but one's still authoring the dream in a particular way, right? It's still subject to the will. Um, so what I suggested in the paper is one way of responding to this challenge that I put forward um, is to revise the imagination model to say that there's 
Uh, what's going on in, in non-lucid dreams is uh, instances of involuntary imagination. So on this view, it'd be like the, the, the right analogy would not be um, when I ask what kind of experience am I having when I'm dreaming that I'm in front of the Tower of London. It's not one that if I were to imagine, close my eyes and visually imagine the Tower of London. But it's one that would be something like um, a sort of unbidden image. So, you know, when you're uh, walking along sometimes, um, if, you, if you have mental imagery, um, you often sort of have a uh, flash of, it could be a memory or it could just be an image. And so one, one has these flashes of imagery when, when one's drifting to sleep often. This is sort of hypnagogic imagery. And um, so the suggestion is on this view that, that, that that's the right kind of experience to talk about when we're talking about non-lucid dreams, not the, the active sense of imagination. And this, is get, this gets around the objection. Um, because um, aphantasic people often report that they do have this unbidden imagery, even though they lack this uh, positive, identical capacity to generate that at will. I'm not sure if you covered this in the paper, but one thought I had is, could it be possible that someone has like almost like a particular type of aphantasia in the sense that they are unable to voluntarily um, visually imagine things when they're awake? But they're able to do that when they're asleep. Um, no, that that that. Sorry, that um, that the imagination that they're not able to do when they're awake, they can't voluntarily kind of conjure up a, an image. But that kind of capacity for that is active when they're when they're asleep. So um, it's not that if they don't have it when they're awake, it's not possible when mm-hmm. they're asleep. Could that be a possibility? Yeah, I think so. There's something that I do briefly touch on um, in the paper. So I, I guess so. Um, I think that that's certainly possible, right? But I think someone who is wanting to say that would have to give us an account of why the mechanisms which underlie voluntary imagery when we're awake are, are, are completely different and isolated from the ones when we're asleep, right? I think it's much more plausible to say that it's not voluntary, right? That it, and actually this is borne out by more of the empirical work on the nature of mental imagery, is that there are distinct circuits for voluntary and involuntary imagery in the brain, right? So on this view, the idea would be that aphantasia, typically understood, is a deficit of the voluntary case, but not the other one. Um, so to answer, I think that it's, it's definitely possible, but then what you need is a story about why, why that, what's the positive reason for thinking that's true rather than just a mere possibility. And it seemed, did you say there's some kind of maybe evidence against it? There's these circuits um, seem to be like for voluntary and involuntary and you see that there's no evidence there's separate circuits and so it looks like... It looks yeah, like yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think just it would just be, you need to have a, a sort of empirical account of, of the nature of, of imagery um, such that one could voluntarily imagine it uh, while asleep. And, uh, you know, what, and what, also what's the, what's the connection between sleep and, and mental imagery in that case? You know, is it... How, how, how would that work as, a, as, a, as an empirical account of what's going on? It's perhaps something that I could have asked a bit earlier on because you, you know, you've said what aphantasia is, um, you've talked about dreams, but just to get a bit kind of detailed, so how do you kind of actually describe what imagination is? Mm-hmm. Um, how do you kind of characterise it and explain what's going on there? I think there's a, you also talk about it with reference to beliefs, I think, in the paper. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, maybe just kind of like a, how would you kind of describe that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is, I think, a big, you know, big philosophical topic in its own right. Um, I think the, the best way of of, um, of motivating what imagination is 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 just to point to uh, instances of imagination, right? Um, rather than say, here's a worked out philosophical theory of what it is. Um, and I think that all you need there is is again this sort of distinction between standing in front of the Tower of London you're seeing the Tower of London and visually imagining it now, right? The, the question of, of, of imagination and philosophy is that these seem to be different kinds of experiences. It doesn't seem to be the same. Um, and that's part of our common sense way of thinking about our minds is that they make a distinction between things which are uh, imaginative experiences which are not tied to reality in the same way and perceptual experiences which in many cases are veridical. The, you're having a connection with the world, which is actually there. Um, and so the, the philosophical project in imagination is to say, well, what, what does this distinction amount to, right? Is it on a continuum with perception or is it complete kind altogether? And there are various proposals to, to how, to, to trying to um, 
to flesh that out, right? You know, so one of the ones is the one I mentioned already about agency, right? Imagination seems to be subject to our agency, whereas we can't control what we perceive in that way. Um, and just to touch on the, on the belief case, so so for a long time, um, philosophers have focused on mental imagery. That seems to be when you when I ask you to think about imagination, you'll often come what will often come up is mental imagery, right? Um, but there's another type of um, either type or something else which is involved in imagining, which is a sort of attitude um, to one's experience. Um, so if we're having a perceptual experience right now, my perceptual experience is also involving various beliefs. So I have a belief that the table is in front of me right now and that the chair's underneath me. Um, another, so looking at an analog thing of imagination, so if I'm having a visual daydream and it's really, um, I'm really immersed in my daydream, right? Uh, what are the attitudes that are like belief-like that I'm taking towards this experience? So you know, visual imagination of walking um, through London, right? Um, philosophers tend to think that there's a different kind of imagination there, which is imagining that, or what philosophers call propositional imagination. So it's not that I believe when I'm having this immersive daydream that I'm actually in London. I'm just imagining that I am. Um, and this is the yeah, distinction, which is supposed to mirror um, beliefs in the perceptual case. I feel like um, upon re reflection, you look back at um, an experience of imagining something and you know that, yes, I imagined it. It wasn't I was literally there at the Tower of London. But when you're in the moment and you're imagining something, especially if you've got the ability to kind of like conjure up very vivid um, visual, um, you know, visual imaginations, the experience when you're actually beside the Tower of London and also when you're visually um, imagining it, in that moment, are they they seem kind of potentially similar, especially if you're able to very. It's only afterwards that we say they're different. Because you say afterwards, where we can look back on it and say, oh, "I was just imagining that." But at the same time, experientially, how are they? Do they do they differ? Just in that it's just a reduced um, experience. It's not as bright and vivid, and you can't see all the details. I'm just wondering about any maybe similarities once you're actually in the moment. There, mm -hmm. like yeah, interesting. So so that, I mean that's that's certainly possible, and um, it's been. I think this links to. A particular account which I sort of gestured out, which is um, a Humean one, where there's perception and a mental imagery on a continuum, um, and it, and like you say, it might be more plausible for people who have very vivid mental imagery. So these are people that have been coined hyperphantasics, so people that report having mental imagery so vivid that it's akin to perception, um, and you know they say they you, you hear people that can't um, you know read horror stories for uh, reasons that it's sort of like you're having a very vivid uh, experience, which is really, really scary. Um, but then I think, so even if one was to think that there's, there can be similarities between the vividness, you might think that's just not all there is to these categories. It's not just the sort of vividness of the experience, but it seems very important to distinguish between imagination and perception so far as perception seems to put you in more in touch with reality than imagination, right? Um, it just seems to be a different sort of thing altogether. Um, so there are sort of other features that you can appeal to to, to make this distinction. So are there any practical implications from your thinking on this area or from possible uh, future research into aphantasia and, and kind of ideas around it? Yeah, so um, I suppose the, the big thing about the future work, um, which it suggests, is to do more research on the, dream, the nature of the dreams that aphantasic subjects have. So this is something I suggest looking at in more detail. That's sort of um, the, the 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 details and issues that I discuss in the paper actually uh, raise right. So questions about like maybe we should do some a lot more uh, concrete phenomenological work on looking at the subjective reports of dreaming dreams of aphantasic. So is it really true that they have the same kinds of dreams? Um, and another line of thought is 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 to is to look at the question of whether um, aphantasics have lucid dreams. Um, so this is something which, at the moment, there's no real data on, um, but something which I think would lend support for different views about the nature of dreaming. So I think in general, uh, yes, there is room for more work in this field, um, and which this paper sort of raises, uh, sort of gives a case for looking at uh, in more detail, which is um, 
yes, Aphantasia has had lots of attention in the case of what's the nature of their imagery, right? We should look a bit more at a feature which is accepted about them, but which is, you know, their, their dreams. Just to kind of go a little bit more kind of broad on, the, on this area on that, do you think that dreams are one of the most complicated psychological phenomena that we've got to try and understand? Are they kind of um, high up in those big questions and, and, and things we don't understand about the mind, do you think, dreams? Yeah, I mean, I love dreams as a research topic. It's obviously one of, one of my uh, one of my favorite things. I mean, yeah, I, I would say yes. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not sure about whether it's the most complicated, um, but it's certainly something which calls out for explanation. Um, so this is something I think I feel quite strongly about, and I think it relates to uh, my own research history of looking at consciousness. So it seems to have been in the history of philosophy just a really uh, potentially disproportional amount of attention to the, the notion of consciousness as subjective experience or phenomenal consciousness, right? Um, but if I ask you, you know, is that person conscious over there laying on the floor? What am I asking, right? So I might be asking, are they having a subjective experiences at all? Uh, and this is often arguably what's going on when you say, is an insect conscious? Do they have any conscious experience at all? But there's another sense um, which I think is crucial to a common sense understanding of consciousness, which is, are they awake? So I want to know, is that person knocked out? <laughs> are they in a coma? Um, are they dreaming? Um, and in this sense, um, so this is getting at the sense of consciousness as wakeful consciousness, which has just had very little attention, um, although it's now slowly beginning to change. Um, and I think, that, I think that's a mistake. Um, and is is and along with dreaming, this, these sorts of changes to experiences, along wakeful dreaming cases, um, yeah, are one of the big bigger questions, right? And I think there's a further a further issue actually, which I've been thinking a bit more about recently, which is whether the problem of consciousness might just be a problem of wakeful consciousness. So, and this this is a view of uh, which has been recently. I mean, not quite in those terms, but there's there's been work done by um, one of my supervisors at King's, Matthew Soterio, on um, the nature of wakeful consciousness. And he ties uh, the nature of wakeful consciousness to a point of view. So the idea is that what do we mean when subjects have a point of view? Maybe they're occupying this, this species-specific point of view on the world. And then if you look at the history of the debates and the details of the debates on consciousness, often they'll be tied very closely to this idea of point of view. Um, and something which I'm sort of leaning closer towards is this idea that maybe a lot of philosophy of consciousness has gone um, down the wrong route in, in, in looking at the wrong concept of consciousness. Maybe, if not the only concept, maybe it's not completely going to subsume everything we want to know about phenomenal consciousness. It might nonetheless be a concept of consciousness which is the most morally salient. So it might be that um, maybe it's wakeful consciousness that underwrites things like moral status, which philosophers are typically tied to phenomenal consciousness. Maybe there's a big role for thinking about departures from wakeful consciousness in terms of responsibility. So looking at responsibility, often lots of departures from responsibility are tied to different states of consciousness. So extreme cases of this are cases of sleepwalking, um, and there's famous uh, cases of, of people committing all sorts of things uh, when they're asleep. And typically this is thought to like sort of remove responsibility from, um, exculpate someone right, from, from responsibility. And yeah, so I think there's just an idea here. Sorry, that was quite long. <laughs> um, an idea here that um, there's a shift from thinking of, about phenomenal consciousness to things like dreaming, wakeful consciousness, which I think is really important, not only for uh, philosophy, but for science. I'm intrigued as well if anything in particular inspired you to, to write about this area, <clears throat> to write this paper, to be thinking about dreaming and aphantasia and uh, yeah, what, what inspired this, this paper? So yeah, like I said, I think it was, my supervisor was doing this research seminar on dreaming, which got me really thinking about, well, maybe I've been thinking about the wrong kind of consciousness. <laughs> or maybe there is a lot more less saturated, interesting, um, open area of dream of consciousness studies about dreaming, which is 
you know, slightly different than, than the phenomenal consciousness debate. Um, and then I, I was just I was just aware of, of this research going on from from Adam um, in Exeter. Been, I'd been just to a few talks of his in London, um, and I thought, oh, I wonder what those people say about dreams, right? Given that I was now being made aware of this debate about dreaming, um, I thought this sounds like a very good test case for those theories of dreaming. So apart from your res- uh, the continuing research on depression mm-hmm. and related areas, I just yeah, I wanted to kind of, as one of the final questions, ask you if you've got any particular future plans for research, mm-hmm. any areas we've not spoke about at all today, or um, yeah, what's kind of in store for the next few years, do you think? Yeah, so immediate plans are to do uh, more empirically uh, informed work on, on depression and um, collaborate with various people to test it and to inv- to try and work out a bit more of a precise account of global states of consciousness. So I've got some uh, recent uh, funding to uh, have a series of workshops this summer with medical practitioners um, and mental health uh, charities to sit- talk about how uh, what they think about this model of depression, how it might think about challenges, think about potential impact um, from from my work. Um, so that's sort of the immediate thing. Um, but in terms of um, other philosophical issues, so I have a I have a long-standing research interest, and this is something that I also uh, touched on um, and developed a bit further at NYU last year. So um, very famous philosopher there called Thomas Nagel who is one of my philosophical heroes, I suppose you, you could say. Um, so I have a, a long-standing interest in, 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 in Nagel's work, um, particularly on philosophical methodology. So I think it's um, very important for philosophers to be reflective, not only on what they call first-order questions about the world, like is there free will, what is consciousness, what is imagination, but also to reflect very seriously on the nature of the methodology which they bring to bear on those questions. Um, so Thomas Nagel has a, a view of, of philosophy as resulting from a tension between different ways of looking at the world or conceptualising the world. So, And this is one that's not unique to Nagel, you find it. Um, this, and I'm interested in tracing this back in the history of philosophy, but I mean, um, sort of more contemporary, um, an obvious person is Wilfred Sellers, who has a famous paper on philosophy and the scientific image of man. Um, and what you find in, in Nagel and Sellers is this idea that philosophical problems like the problem of free will arise from a tension between a subjective understanding of the world and an objective one. So when I think about myself as an agent who, who, who uh, exercises agency, um, I can think about it from the inside, from where I am right now. And right now it seems like I have complete autonomy. Um, over my own actions. I freely can pick up the cup and choose. I could have chosen not to do that. Right? And then there's a tension between that way of looking at things and when one looks at things externally from an objective perspective. right? So you look at the perspective of the world given to us by physics or um, chemistry and there's just an objective. It's just a matter of events unfolding in a causal way, a potentially deterministic way if one is not uh, paying attention to quantum mechanics. Um, and it just, the idea is that there just doesn't seem to be room for that co- conception that we started with of ourselves in that objective world. Um, and the idea is that you that you find similar tensions for all philosophical problems. Um, so, so, just to bring it back to me, I'm interested in thinking, in developing that idea, right? That there's a causal etiology of philosophical problems. So what I want to do is to develop this picture of the source and cause of philosophical problems um, and think about what it means for philosophical progress, about how we can make progress in philosophy. So as a final question, one kind of thing I've start, I thought I'd start to do in the show is have like the same question for mm-hmm. every guest. Um, I've only done this once before <laughs> and I think it's pretty fit in to have a philosopher answer this. Um, question but it's a little bit different we've obviously been talking mostly I guess about philosophy of mind so it's more of an ethics based question but I'm trying to ask every guest at the end of the show uh, the same question which is to yourself what what do you think it means to live a good life oh wow okay (sighs) interesting and I feel the pressure as a philosopher sorry to put you on Um, the spot there (laughs) what do I think Mm. So if, probably typical uh, philosophical answer, I don't think there is a good way, just one way in which you can live a good life. Um, 
it seems tied to the question about the meaning of life, um, of which I'm sort of pl- sympathetic to a pluralist view of, of the meaning of life. Um, there's not really just one thing that you might mean by meaning of life. Um, I would say I would be inclined to have a sort of instantiation of, of objective goods. <laughs> so if you had a life full of things like friendship, um, maybe epistemic goods like knowledge um, and that sort of thing. So a good life would be one where you had lots of those things on that list. Well, Cecily, thanks so much. That was really interesting. And uh, yeah, I think the, the work you're doing on depressants sounds super interesting and important and could you know spark lots of changes. So best of luck with all that. And uh, thanks for your time. It's really interesting. Thank you so much. I had a great time. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you enjoyed the Human Podcast, please consider subscribing. I hope to see you soon.